you got to know what, if you're getting a dog that's artificially bred for a, a specific purpose. And somehow they decided to, to send this dog to an elderly couple in Santa Clarita. Thing I want to mention, you mentioned I'm one of the last Weatherwax trainers. And I am one of the last, but I'm the only active one. Some say these two trainers were quietly in the shadows. Robert Weatherwax, last of the legendary Lassie trainers from the world's greatest movie dog training family, was quietly hidden in his TV work. And Christoph Klugston elite action K9 trainer was traveling from the sub-zero arctic to the sweltering jungle heat training dogs on three continents. But a chance meeting changed all of that. Now, Robert and Christoph have joined forces and they're breaking the silence. For the first time, the secretive and hidden world of the movie dog trainer and the science of the elite tactical trainer will be revealed. That's right, they are out of the shadows. Welcome to Tactical Practical. And we're going to tackle a big topic that a lot of you people ask me about who are beginner first-time dog owners or maybe it's your second dog and that's how do you pick the best dog that fits into your life for you and i uh, approach this from the fact of where do you where do you live your location that is do you live in a city do you own a house do you own a or are you living in a condominium or an apartment or do you live out in the rural out in a ranch or a farm, which is the best scenario for having a dog that's that's much easier for this selection process. Or and also, what is your job? What do you do? How how much time are you at home? This that's gonna that's gonna dictate what type of dog you get because of how much needs the dog has. Because you, they're not furniture. You can't just abandon a dog and just leave the dog alone. Some dogs need more attention than other dogs. We're gonna cover that. And also the dynamics of, of your living situation. Are you married? Do you have kids? Or do you live alone? Or do you have roommates? All of these things are important to the selection process. And, uh, and one other aspect that I'll throw in here to begin with, and think about all these things as we go through this because we'll cover them in more detail. But what type of lifestyle do you have? Are you a person who is athletic? Do you do a lot of things outside? Do you have a lot of motion? Do you have a lot of things going on? Or, or are you an indoor person who doesn't do anything very much? Are you an introvert or extrovert? Do you have a lot of friends? Do they come over? Do you go to them? How much time will you be actively spending with your dog? Will you be? And what sort of situation do you want to have the dog accompany you in? If you don't want it to have the dog accompany you at all, that's maybe something you should think about getting a gerbil <laughs> on, or along those lines. Yeah, uh, Robert has written a book uh, we have talked about before a little bit. I did want to elaborate on what you talked about regarding uh, choosing the right dog because that's to me the very first step i mean even more so a first step than puppy training which puppy training may or may not uh you know you got to look at what the dog's going to become right a lot of people say oh yeah i got this dog and he sleeps in my bed and he's a great dane but he's little right now i'm like well he's not going to stay little so keep that in mind and you probably shouldn't be living in an apartment and have a great dane Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I, I get this stuff all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, recently somebody called me and said, uh, I, I want you to train my dog, but I want him to, to go to you because I, I'm going to take a vacation. And I just want you to train my dog. But I don't really do that. I go to people's homes. So I had to turn her down, but I asked her, so where are you moving? Well, I've got this German Shepherd, and we're moving uh, this German Shepherd puppy, and we're moving to an apartment in Dallas. Are you kidding? You're kidding, right? You're going to live in an apartment with this dog? No. Those are times when I'm almost glad that I didn't get the client, right? That I, that because I'm going to train a dog that's used to all this, that having room, a big backyard, and we're going to put him in the urban environment in a small apartment. Um, there's another thing you might want to uh, point out, too, and a lot of it is, is maintenance. You mentioned you know, where you're living, the energy of the dog compared to your energy. Um, but you also have to look at things like grooming. And, and care. Yeah. Uh, right, right. I, I mentioned yeah. I, and I mentioned a lot about purebreds that they tend to have more veterinary bills and they're more expensive to acquire, which is why I'm always pushing getting a mutt because it's cheaper. They tend to to have better genetics as far as you know not getting sick as much. But, um, I also want to think about the coat because I grew up work with collies and we spent like as much time grooming the dogs as we did training the dogs. Uh, you know, and then after that, when I my first dog that I trained as a movie trainer, was a Briard. And uh, that's another uh, uh, grooming nightmare. 
Um, so, you know, that's why my favorite small dog is a beagle. Because I'm thinking, beagle's about the easiest thing you can take care of, right? They're small. They got short hair. They're fairly active, but not like off the wall active, like a Jack Russell or a Malinois or something. Yeah. yeah. But but they're definitely high energy. So, you know, you really have to think about that. I, I did have one uh, dog that I, I reformed that was a flunky from the Alabama Police Department when I was back in L.A. And he was a Malinois. And somehow they decided to, to send this dog to an elderly couple in Santa Clarita. And I thought, what is an elderly couple doing with a, a young Malinois that's been trained to be aggressive but flunked the program because he wouldn't out anything, right? So um, anyway, somehow they got this dog. And I trained the dog over all its problems because it wanted to kill everything, right? It wanted to kill other dogs, wanted to kill other people. Um, so I took this dog around. He desensitized him to things. Um, I didn't use any shock therapy on the dog. There's no electronic uh, training. I did it all organically. And, and back in L.A., I did a lot more of that that way because most people lived in the city. Uh, a lot of my electronic training goes because people live, like you mentioned, on these huge pieces of property, and there's no fences, and I don't want the dog ending up on the highway. So a lot of times, that's the biggest place I'll use the electronic training is in my recall, but that's another episode. I'm just going to give it back to you and just tell you that there's a lot of things to consider. Um, yeah. Like when, when you get a dog, you need to be making a checklist of all the reasons why you're getting this dog. Um, mm. It's not, like you said, it's not a piece of furniture. It's not a shoe or a hat. Um, it's not something you can just yeah. throw in the closet and forget about it, right? Yeah. Um, so you have to treat it like having a child. I don't have a dog right now because I'm out seeing other people's dogs. So I get my personal fix because I get to train everybody's dog. And But uh, I don't bring in a dog because I don't want to neglect them, especially in those beginning months when they're young. They really yeah. need a lot of time. You yeah. can't just say, well, it's a puppy. I'll just lock them up all day and I'll go to work as I normally do. No, sometimes it takes a little bit of a life adjustment. Um, having one person maybe working right. at home, um, you know, and that's another thing too. It's not just what size the dog and the energy level and the, the coat and all that stuff, the maintenance, like what you're going to do with this dog, like what are you going right. to do your activities, um, just the whole, uh, you know, you want to make sure that your, your place is also child proofed when you bring a dog in, you don't want, yeah. you know, electrical yeah. hazards yeah. and things that they could chew that will kill them. Mm -hmm. um, just like kids, you know, that's why I always hated those Legos, because I kept thinking, oh, man, somebody's going to swallow one of those, right? Mm -hmm. um, and dogs are no exception. So, anyways, I'll let you uh, move on yeah, to okay. our next point, but I, I think you hit most everything on the head, really. Yeah, well, okay, let me get into this a little bit more in detail, because this is something that drives me crazy with a lot of people, with most people, and this has been since the, their explosions. So when Robert and I started training dogs way back, there there wasn't this pet dog phenomenon like there is now. There were there really weren't a lot of pet dog trainers, and they weren't making the sort of money that every, that five million people are doing today. And that happened somewhere in the mid '90s because people moved into the urban areas. Again, there was a after World War II there was a big influx into the cities, but again in the '90s this happened, and people decided that they wanted to have some sort of uh, they they lost touch with pastoral life is what it's called and so they just ever the ownership of dogs went way up but the problem one of the big problems is okay these people didn't know they didn't, they didn't some of them didn't grow up with dogs they didn't really know what dogs were and they just looked at them and uh, this is one of my problems that i have with people they treat them like their furniture like oh they get the dog they they want to show the dog off to other people but they don't want to do what's uh, what it takes and requirements to take care of the dog like you're talking about the grooming or the veterinary stuff or watching what they eat you got to you got to be on top of them like you were saying like a toddler you got especially when they're pop you can't let them be unsupervised. You have to have them supervised. Management is everything uh, with dogs uh, on all phases, but especially with a puppy. But one of the things that you'll find everybody doing uh, is that they pick dogs on their looks. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the people will pick these dogs and I, and I recently had a discussion with somebody who was picking they have a house and they have money uh, but they don't have a huge amount of acreage or anything and they don't have livestock but they're picking livestock guarding dogs as their pet dogs and Anatolan you know how huge those dogs are those mm -hmm. 
those dogs are not designed, they were not bred to be with humans. They were bred to be around uh, sheep or, or, or cattle, bond with them. They bond with livestock better than they bond with humans, and they're independent, meaning they're not going to listen to you <laughs> as easily as what a pet dog trainer wants. They want a dog that's going to be easy for them. They don't they don't want to deal with the hard dogs, single-minded on things. They don't want to deal with a the greyhound. They don't want to... They don't want to deal with an American Bulldog. They don't want to deal with a Malinois. They don't want to deal with a uh, Doberman. These dogs, you have to you have to know their mentality, which is something else we can get into. But what I, I want to stay on this, uh, they pick dogs on their looks and not what they were selectively, because humans have used dogs. Most of the dog's existence, they have used dogs. And what does that translate to? That means that they've, uh, they've uh, uh, artificially bred them for certain characteristics and to make them stronger. I, like I'll see people with Australian cattle dogs and they wonder why these dogs are chasing their children and why they're nipping at their children. This is not a fault. This is not some behavioral problem. This is It's an outlet. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a gen no, it's genetically coded. How the hell do you think that they move cattle around? Australian cattle dogs are tough dogs. They are extremely tough dogs, and they have a lot of energy, a lot of endurance, and how do you think that they move a 1,500-pound steer? Because they nip, at, they bite at their heels. Oh, they look cute. I like the way they look. Well, you got to know what, if you're getting a dog that's artificially bred for a, a specific purpose, you've got to know what that purpose is. And you cannot blame the dog. You cannot blame the dog. And you certainly, if you don't train, you can't blame. So that's where we come in. And Robert d deals with a lot more of this than I do. I like to deal with the people who are training dogs and I got to say our overall aim because people ask me what is your overall aim with everything with the podcast with the videos we want to be here as a resource for you to be a better dog trainer and a better dog owner and they're trying to hit both of those things right here you've got to know about what the like I'm saying Australian catalog you see people doing this you see people bringing bird dogs they're going to the windows looking at birds and they want to jump through the window because what do you think that they <laughs> were selectively bred to do uh, and the same thing we talk about about terriers uh, like Jack Russell Robert talked about Jack Russell but there's many other terriers these were meant to go after varmints after varmints like the Jed Clampett mm -hmm. would say on, uh, on the Beverly Hillbillies <laughs> so when they see anything moving that's small and that could be a cat they're gonna go for them and they're and they don't stop they have a single-minded purpose they have a terrier there which means earthbound sort of dog they will dig and dig and dig they don't give up I mean they were used to get rats out of infested factories and houses and they still use that sometimes in, in England I still see it some places in the uh, back east in the United States but you get a dog like that and you're oh he won't stop doing this he won't yeah because they were bred to have be tough I mean to be mentally tough yeah uh, and that's that's a big part of it yeah, that's a big part of it too because I I always like to classify dogs in the working and non-working category now obviously shepherds are working dogs uh, you know herding dogs are working dogs hunting dogs are sporting dogs but yeah. to me they're all considered to, to be dogs that were designed for a specific function they need some activity so find something that they like find some act some productive play that they can participate in to supplement what they're not getting um, you know it's just very important uh, they're living beings and they have to be satisfied uh, just as we do as far as activity and primal urges quote unquote you know yeah absolutely and one of the things that thinking well well what can I do there's a lot of things because now there are a lot of dog sports and it doesn't mean you have to play them at a high competitive level and I'm talking about there's such thing as dock diving both distance and height for that competition also there's uh, the frisbee thing but I don't recommend that because a lot of dogs get hurt and paralyzed from that you use the wrong type of dog for that and the landing for the dogs is uh, not good a lot of times sports that you can look at that aren't as involved say as agility which is more involved but there's all these things you can do with your dog so it's a bonding experience with your dog and, but you, you can or you cannot do that I just put that out there as information but one of the things I want to get back to is that when we're talking about selecting a dog and thinking about the parameters of what you need or what you don't. You gotta think about 
the mental wiring of the dog and this is sort of what we already touched on but I want you to concentrate on it people because this is again if you're you're getting a dog that was meant to be aloof and independent and used as a livestock guarding I'll go back to that that dog is going to be aloof and independent he's, going to, he's not going to be one of the arm the arm carrying type of dogs he's never going to be a, a cockapoo or something like that plus it's going to be over 100 pounds and you got to think about the size requirements we talked about that a little bit before but you got to really concentrate on the size requirements and we're talking about all aspects the area that the dog needs inside the house his area that he's going to be in the bed area if you're going to have a kennel you're going to have to have an area that's big enough for the dog and you must also think about this too when you're getting the dog is the dog going to be indoor back in the days when we we're talking about the ranch people in farms a lot of people had outdoor dogs and they spent 98 percent of their time outdoors but they had somewhere they could go outdoors they were in the they were in the horse barn they weren't just left outside now it's more common and people think especially if you live in an urban setting that you're going to have your dogs inside at least 60 70 percent of the time so you have to think about the area and you need to uh, a child proofing this area what we talked about a little bit but you really need to child proof this area and you're also going to have to be ready <laughs> for problems you're going to have to accept that right robert i mean you're going to have to accept that you're going to have to be doing some cleaning and you're going <laughs> to and you're going to have some, some mishaps that you didn't think ahead of for because you can't you can't plan for everything absolutely and, and you know a dog that gets uh you know act outdoor activity uh and this applies pretty much to all dogs but more so with those high energy dogs that you were referring to um they they need the walk not you know sometimes just people think that you know i have a dog i have a big yard uh they can exercise themselves but it's never as stimulating as it is going out getting the smells uh i think in my book i talk about it i i uh put it on a parallel with receiving mail when we were out at sea uh it's like oh my god you know nothing going on and then all of a sudden here comes all this mail right uh we were excited we were like literally excited, like, you know, paying the postman to get us our stuff, you know, yeah. uh, earlier than everybody else. Um, you know, it was just like a big deal. And when a dog goes out and smells the bushes and smells new things, it's just like the same thing. It's like Christmas morning. And I can't emphasize how important it is for dogs to be able to explore. That's why I use the long leash. It's the perfect leash for all dogs, because if the dog doesn't go anywhere, it works great. If the dog likes to run around, sniff stuff, it works great then, too. So it's like the what I call the leash for all season. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that why do you need to use more tools than necessary? Just make sure that whatever tools you use, find something that your dog really get, gets to get, get him into a ball, get him into a towel, give him some kind of outlet and teach it early so the dog learns how to play. It's really important for dogs to learn how to play. And a lot of people think that dogs will just do that naturally. But if you do not instill that at a young age, some dogs will never really enjoy playing. And we're, we're starting to go off on a little bit in, in depth here, but I think it's important to hit some of the major points that you should consider. We're saying you got to consider the size, the breed, the mentality, the, what they were genetically, artificially bred to do. Uh, you have to think about your lifestyle, where you live, your living uh, arrangements, how many people are in the house. That's also very important. And something else that we haven't touched on, and that's a routine. A lot of people assume that the dog can match their their uh, cycle or their routine, and that's not true. The dog is going to have to go to the bathroom when the dog has to go to the bathroom, and you cannot control that when they're a puppy. I mean, you're going to be looking at probably you need to be watching the dog every 20 minutes. I mean, you need to be actively putting the dog somewhere where they can go to the bathroom every 20 minutes. Oh, and if you're not willing to accept that, then you better get willing to accept some messes that you're going to be cleaning up because that's the way it is. Now, having said that, Robert grew up with 25 dogs. The, the importance of having that kennel on a routine was tandem, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. We had, we, had a, we had a rotation. 
whenever we fed the dogs, we always fed them in the same order. We always ran them in the same order with the same groups of dogs that they were used to running with. Not every dog got along at our kennels because just because, you know, one was on one end and the other one was way down there and they didn't see each other that much. So they never really learned to get along. That's another thing you want to consider too, is that you want to get your dogs around other dogs, uh, exposed to as much things as possible. And even more so depending on the breed. That's why you have to be aware of that energy level. The thing I keep alluding to is more of the energy level, not so much the size, because I know uh, Christoph has been talking about more about the size and the practicality of owning a dog. I'm thinking more about, at this moment, about the energy level of the dog, um, because like he said, you can't, if you're a jogger, a basset hound's probably not the breed for you. You know what I'm saying? You want to get a dog that would keep up with your activities, right? Um, yeah, you don't want a dog that's not equipped to do yeah. what you want to do, and vice versa. You don't want to right, be unequ right. ill-equipped to do what the dog can do. So if you're a, if you're an active person, get yourself a sporting, a working dog. If yeah. you're not, you know, maybe get yourself something that's not so mobile, like a basset hound, like a Shih Tzu, um, like uh, there's a lot of breeds, Poolies. Yeah. I mean, I could go down the list of dogs right. that aren't right. very active and not necessarily tiny but yeah. you know not giant uh, and then that's another thing too if you have a giant dog yeah. like a saint bernard you'd better have a, a, a very large yard you could have a, live in a condo and have a, a a maltese and the patio is just fine and then you could supplement it with walks out on the street stuff like right. that but it's all relative to the size imagine if you were the size of that dog uh, remember when I mentioned this part in my book too about remember when you were a kid and you looked up at the cupboards and they looked so high and you thought how am I going to get up there looking for a chair or something you can get up on so you can get the cereal out of the cupboard right well it's kind of the same way with the dog you know it's all relative to the size you can't go jogging with a little tiny dog for a mile and a half uh, mm -hmm. and expect them not to die somewhere along the road right yeah, um, you need a d yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly you got to think about how many steps that dog has to take yep, to keep yep, up with yep. one step of you. That's something to keep in mind. And, you know, I also be attentive on your walks because I see a lot of people. That's why I give, I rip the retractable leash so much. I know it has its uses, but mm -hmm. I find it's a, a tool of laziness for owners because mm -hmm. they're not paying attention to their dog. Uh, they got the retractable leash and they're on the phone. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the dog is like barking at other things and doing all this bad stuff. And, and it's because nobody he knows nobody's paying attention to it. So pay attention to your dog. The walk isn't for you. It's for the dog. There is a lot you said about knowing how to use the tool. That's what I want to say. You got to use the right tool for the right situation. Expert can use tools in a different way than another person. Like chainsaw art, right? Can can many pe how many people can actually carve something with a chainsaw? They they can't. But there are people who make incredible figurines and figures, statues more or less, out of out of uh, stumps and logs with a chainsaw. I mean, it's amazing. But most people they're just going to end up tearing up and ruining and cutting through a log. And that's the same thing with some of the tools that we're talking about for dogs. Do that. Like, I would not recommend using a flexi for a walk. Now, the flexi is for other things. I'm, if you stick with this and all that stuff, I will go d down those roads at some point. You should not surprise your dog with a new dog by just showing up at home with the new dog although i have done that but you should in my estimation take your prior dog to go meet the would-be candidate yeah yeah i talk about that in my book too about you know adding a new member to the household and that could be a baby a person another dog but let's just concentrate on the other dog i typically what i do is i'll ask the owner to bring the existing dog, the resident dog, uh, the incumbent dog, so to speak, <laughs> have them come out, right? Have them come out and meet the dog, not on their yard, but maybe on the yep. neighbor's yard or out on neutral. the street, just yeah, neutral. neutral territory. That's right. So once they meet each other and they're cool, then what I do is, and I have the visiting dog go in first so that the incumbent dog cannot reestablish territory in the house before the other dog even gets in. If you're out at a dog park or something, and every dog is loose, make sure your dog is loose too. You don't want your dog to become a victim because they're the only dog at a party wearing a leash, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah. so that's, uh, that's another consideration. Um, just a lot of this is psychological. It's, it's about understanding your dog and understanding 
that certain breeds are more intense, uh, certain breeds are larger, certain breeds have longer coats, require more maintenance. Some dogs require larger veterinary bills. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you got it, it just depends on what's important to you. Like, yeah. what is, is a long coated dog really that important? Is a giant dog really that important? What are you going to do with the dog, right? Um, these are all things you need to consider before you even get a dog. You don't just, like you say uh, at the beginning, you don't just get a dog because it looks good. Um, you have to get a dog that's functional based on what your requirements are. Dog, don't get the dog and then make a plan. You know, yeah, make the plan yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, companion. Okay, fine. That that is a role, though. Companion dog is is a role and so there's a lot of things like okay but then when you say companion dog which is fine it's wonderful this that's great what is your type of lifestyle because that's going to depend that's going to it's like okay right. just like your friends like if you say hey you know I, I want a friend well okay but you're meeting people who are rock climbers but you don't climb <laughs> you're scared right. of climbing it's not going to work out is what i'm getting to <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not going to work out or uh, they're skydivers but you're definitely scared of getting up on a ladder you know it's it's mm -hmm. not, they don't want to hang out with you to either that's another thing too it, there have been some cases i've seen where the dogs don't want to be around the people it's not that the people, you know, everybody wants to think from the person's point of view, the human view, but it's also about the dog. Does the dog, <laughs> does the dog like you? And I, right. I think, yeah, I mean, we've both been around long enough to see a, a lot of dogs who don't like the people that they're with. And, and they look at something you've been, I know you've seen it, Robert. You see the dog going, get me the hell out of here. You know, I mean. <laughs> because right. once you set up a certain way, a certain system in your house, mm -hmm. stick to that system. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and don't go changing the furniture around and stuff like that either. Yeah, uh, you don't. Yeah, I, yeah you yeah. definitely not. Yeah, yeah you want to keep things uh, as. And if you do change anything, let the dog be there to witness the change, yeah, so it's not a surprise, you know. Yeah, and don't do it all at one time. Just I know people who get oh they just want to redecorate them just because that's their weirdness, you know. And it's right. like the dogs are like screwed my entire environment, and, it's, uh, and they're going to be in uh, shock. Really, they're going to be in shock, and there's going to be some repercussions because of that. Just like when you oh, yeah. move, when you move, it's like any changes because yeah, dogs want a routine. I mean, they really they they do well with routine. I've seen, I've actually seen situations where somebody will move. I get a lot of clients who come to me and say, "My dog was fine until I moved into this new house." And um, it's it's funny, you know, you don't think it'll happen until it happens to you. Um, but I see it all the time. I see where wholesale changes in a dog's lifestyle actually alters their entire way of thinking. And uh, be aware of that. I, you know, I learned it the hard way. So I really got a real good feel of the way dogs thought because I spent uh, the first part of my life trying to emulate them. And, and one thing uh, we'll throw in here is that it's much harder for a dog to go from a bigger area to a smaller area. Right, like, as opposed to vice versa, which is yeah, much easier. It, yeah, it's easier, and the dog will act. A lot of times, dogs, people, a lot of the problems people have is because they have a dog that shouldn't be in that environment to begin with. And if they happen to move out to like, okay, I just used this, the old lassie thing. If they moved out to the farm or the ranch, the dog will be fine. Uh, th they have enough space and room and they can decompress which is what Robert was talking about is that they can decompress if you got them stuck in a in an apartment and they can't do anything the stress factor is enormous on the dog mm -hmm. and yeah and it, will lead, it will lead to a lot of bad habits like uh, being aggressive being chewing. protective yeah. right yeah and digging chewing um, yeah. you know um, but I tell people that when it comes to dogs every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. And I think people should be aware of that, whether they're adding a cat, another dog, moving to a new place, uh, they're all wholesale changes, and you have to give your dog a chance to adapt to that and give them a solid routine right away upon entering a new environment. Um, we don't yeah. want them to have to, to, you know, when they come to that new house you just moved in, let them know where the water's gonna be. Let them know where they're gonna eat. Yeah. You know, yeah. let them know where the backyard is. Get them to, yeah. to check out everything on the property right away. Don't leave anything a mystery. You know, like, oh, they haven't been in the backyard. We've been living here a week. Oh, get them right out there right away. Yeah, let them, let them know where everything is. You know, even dogs that, you know, run away, brought back to their house enough times, they know how to get home. But if you never show them the route, they'll never find their way home.